Good morning and God bless. Welcome to the Front Page Saturday Town Hall Edition. I'm Dominique DePrima, and we are so blessed that you could be here with us this morning. Be free, J. Cole, starting us off. We are talking about Breonna Taylor. We're talking about law enforcement. We're talking about justice and black lives. That is what we are talking about this morning on the KJLH Saturday Town Hall edition of the front page. And I would love to hear from you all day. 520-KJLH, 520-5554, add your area code, and you are in. So uh, pleased to have with us this morning um, a longtime friend of the front page and, of course, uh, KJLH as well. Uh, he has spent, uh, he spent, brings a lifetime experience to the California State Senate, two decades of public service, first as a Gardena City Council member, then a state assembly member, now a state senator representing the 35th District, Senator Stephen Bradford. Good morning. Good morning, Dominic. Thank you for the opportunity. I know that you, like just about everyone that I've talked to, really you know, hit a wall in a sense with the grand jury decision around uh, Breonna Taylor. Of course, Breonna Taylor, as we know by now, uh, killed in the middle of the night by police in Louisville um, on a no-knock warrant. And, you know, then last week we find that uh, there will be no real charges in her death, nothing directly attributable to her killing. Um, And... You know, I'm sure your reaction was just as dismayed as most of the people I've talked to. Uh, outraged, I would have to say. Uh, not only myself, but uh, the entire legislative Black Caucus, uh, the 10 of us, and many folks uh, across the state and across this nation, as you've seen through the demonstrations and, again, the peaceful demonstrations that have taken place over the last four days. So uh, I think it was an insult not only to Breonna Taylor, but to the thousands of African Americans and Latinos who uh, face police violence on a regular basis here in the state and across this nation. And um, I think it was a cowardly act by the Attorney General, uh, Daniel Cameron. Um, It was a political decision. This was nowhere near meeting out justice uh, for Breonna Taylor uh, to not charge a single officer other than the one for wanton endangerment because he fired three shots into a white occupant's apartment, not the 32 shots that he fired into uh, Breonna, or the officers as a whole fired into Breonna Taylor's apartment and uh, striking her and killing her. And, you know, we can say to ourselves, well, this is Louisville, this is Kentucky, this isn't, you know, this is Daniel Cameron, who clearly is a Republican because we saw him at Trump's convention uh, which seemed like a really bad idea right before, you know, this case came down. But here in California, uh, you were not able to pass your own bill, the police decertification bill, SB 731, even though there was overwhelming public support, even though we're supposed to be a blue state. How do we turn policy um, in protest into policy? If we can't pass it in California, where can we do it? I, I agree. I mean, uh, California is now one of five states in the nation that doesn't have a process of getting rid of bad cops. SB 731 was a common sense decertification uh, measure that had broad-based support. Uh, when we introduced it four months ago, um, we had over 70 of our colleagues who took a knee on the west steps of the Capitol, uh, supposedly in support of police reform, but when it came down to uh, casting the vote on the assembly side, we couldn't uh, get a, um, the bill brought up the last day of session. Now, truly, we were in a truncated uh, legislative year due to COVID-19, but there was many members who hid behind uh, the direct pressure that police unions throughout the state of California, police chiefs, sheriffs, uh, uh, put on these members to not vote for this measure. Um, and again, had it been a regular legislative year, the halls of the Capitol would have been filled with the families of these individuals who have lost their lives um, to police brutality, but they weren't, weren't given that opportunity because of COVID. So the lobbyists that represent the police unions, they 
bombarded the legislators with their calls because many of them hit their cell phones and called them directly and put pressure. So I think it speaks volumes that we still need to move forward, not only as California, but as a nation when it comes to police reform. It's one of the things that's really hard to take as a, you know, just a regular citizen who's not a lawmaker that obviously the people want it. I mean, we have never seen this many people march in our country ever. And not only the, the number, but the uh, diversity, luck, yes. from diversity from age, from race, from gender. This is true democracy at Best. I mean, uh, even when we look back to the 50s and the 60s, the civil rights marches that we saw, the March on Washington, we didn't see this type of diversity. And we didn't see this type of consistency either. And again, just since the ruling in, in, in Kentucky, I mean, daily, last night in Sacramento and Bakersfield, you name it, there has not been a major city that hasn't shown some kind of um, Outrage, not only from this ruling, but since the killing of George Floyd, Ahmad Aubrey, you name it. We can go on and on and on from uh, the shooting of uh, Jacob Blake. I mean, this country is sick and tired of what is truly a two-system uh, uh, society when it comes to uh, police uh, policing here in this, uh, this country. We have a, a law enforcement that uh, truly respects white individuals and has totally disregard and no reverence for life when it comes to black and brown people and you know and of course we don't have to go that far astray we you know we've got Dijon uh, Kazi right here in Los Angeles and you know the killings continue here you, and, and it's interesting when you break it down you know that that lobbying process um, you know that lawmakers face so we the voters even though you know we put uh, lawmakers in office we don't have that kind of access that lobbyists have. You know, my my not so humble opinion, uh, police unions should not be allowed to contribute to politicians at all because it's you know, it's just a to me. It's a conflict of interest. But what could we what could we do? I mean, you know, you put forth this legislation and I guess that has some impact or risk to your career. How do we make it? more important for, you know, to listen to the voters than to listen to uh, lobbyists? Well, I've always listened to the voters. And I'm not going to hear cast, uh, you know, aspersions and, you know, boo all lobbyists because there's some great folks who come in and, and do their job in a meaningful and respectful way and, 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 and advocate for good policy change. But... Um, True enough, they have tremendous influence because, again, under this COVID situation, there was no one who could come into this building. But had public access been afforded, I assure you, folks would have been on uh, buses, planes, cars. They would have come up here in droves and support not only of 731, but the numerous police reform measures that we had introduced this year. And luckily, a few of them got signed. But again, um, the voice of the people has to be the, the priority. And that's how I've uh, lived my elected career. I listen to the people. I listen to the people who, who voted me in office. And true enough, Yes, I've been supported by a variety of unions. I have a 100% voting record when it comes to labor issues. But at the same time, I'm not afraid to say no when uh, there's real disagreement. And a lot of times folks are just afraid, uh, colleagues are afraid to say no to police. And uh, they shouldn't have that type of sway. It should be open to both sides and listening to both sides of the argument instead of having your mind made up already. And, of course, we're seeing the same thing on the national level. You've got the Breathe Act. You've got the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, which have pa which passed out of the House and, you know, will not pass the Senate. Um, so, of course, I know you'll say uh, that elections matter and we've got a big one coming up. Without a doubt. I mean, we've heard it all too many times saying this is the most important. I assure you. This is the most important election in our lifetimes, bar none. And we can go back 50 years, 60 years, 100 years. This is the most important. We have a mad man in the White House, a individual who is a dictator, an autocrat, who has no understanding of what leadership truly is. All he's concerned about is his own well-being. He's demonstrated that for three and a half years. He has not grown into the role. And if we haven't seen it, regardless of color, regardless of party, then uh, 
I'm afraid for this country because uh, <laughs> it, it, it's scary what, what, what I see going on daily as an elected official. And, again, I tell my friends, I have plenty of Republican friends. This is not about being Republican or a Democrat. This is about leadership. This is about democracy. This is about and- justice. And we need to vote. And I'm employing everyone I talk to that's 18 and over to get out and vote. It's only three reasons you shouldn't vote. You're under 18, you're not a U.S. citizen, or you're a convicted felon still on parole. But we have Prop 17 on the ballot that will change that. So we need to vote for Prop 17, too. And, yeah, and we've got a lot of stuff. We've got Prop 16, of course, which, you know, brings back affirmative action. We, yes. If you live in L.A., we've got Measure J. Are you talking about, uh, you know, reimagining police? Uh, that's, uh, you know, talking, asking the county to reallocate uh at least 10 percent to community investment, I mean, and alternatives to incarceration. So there's, you know, district attorney race here in L.A. County. There's a lot, even if you, you know, don't care about the presidential or you don't think, you know, that that's something that you want to weigh in on. Uh, let's go to Gil calling us from Inglewood. Gil, you're on with uh, Senator Steve Bradford. Uh, good morning, Senator Bradford. This is Gil Matthew from Inglewood. Okay, good morning. go ahead, please. And I want to let you know that uh, you have lots of community support. On, on the bill with the police reform. However, I'm, I'm disheartened that no local council would support you on the issue. When I say support you, I mean verbally encourage the residents. And it was obviously in Inglewood. So and you're I'm saying you wanted local local politicians to support a state measure? Got it. Okay, thank you, Gil. Appreciate that. I don't no, know if you no, want to speak okay, on that. Thank you. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I'm going to give a shout out to Councilwoman uh, Paulette Francis from the city of Virginia. She clearly supported this measure, and yeah, disappointed that we could have had more support from our local elected officials because uh, that's where you know most of the policing takes place. But uh, we had support. Uh, but Paulette Francis definitely was one of the local elected officials that came out early and strong in, in this measure. All right, we're going to go to Cindy calling us from Inglewood. Inglewood is in this building this morning. Hi, Cindy. Cindy, you with me? Okay, guess we lost Cindy. Um, you are welcome to call 520-KJLH, 520-5554. Uh, for people that are concerned about, you know, our local, what we can do locally to follow up well, I guess that's statewide, but whether it's on, on a city level or a statewide level, aside from voting, what are the things that we can do that do make a difference, especially when it comes to you know, what seems like a recurring uh, scenario um, of, of making some changes in, in law enforcement? As I've been stating for the last year, it's a wash, rent, and repeat cycle that we've seen with uh, law enforcement in this country for the last hundred years. And at some point, uh, we should be sick and tired of being sick and tired. But what residents can do is, again, uh, call your local elected officials, call your mayors, ask them to support this. We're reintroducing this bill at the beginning of the uh, 20, uh, one, uh, 2021 uh, legislative cycle. So uh, this bill has not gone away. We're going to reintroduce it. We have strong support from the uh, Senate President Pro Tem, uh, Tony Atkins, uh, to help move this measure forward, as well as the Speaker. So uh, we're building upon our coalition, so we're going to ask those residents to call in to your legislators, regardless of where you live in the state of California, and say, hey, we want you to support this. We have tremendous support from Kyle Kuzma from the Lakers, uh, Al Black, entertainers, I mean, uh, you name it, we had them on board. Robert De Niro, uh, uh Chelsea Handler, I mean, I, I, the list goes on and the number of celebrities and athletes that are on board who have asked for police reform. So um, I'm just going to ask the uh, residents to use your platform, be it social media and calling and emailing, and uh, just keep the pressure on for the next few months. All right, let's go to Juliet calling us from Watts. Hi, Juliet. Hi, Dominique. This is Juliet. Got it. What's hi, on your mind? Hi, Senator. I brought hi. this up before, Dominique. We discussed it. Can they please have the police unions pay for the lawsuits and the settlements that they've killed people and brutalized people because they're not getting hit in their pockets? We are. We're paying for their salaries with our taxes, and we're paying for the lawsuits so they don't give a darn. 
Yeah, got it. I thank you, Julia. A lot of people have been saying something similar, and that there needs to be financial, not just criminal, accountability for you know the killing of the constituencies that these um, agencies serve. And the bill had the Bain Act in it, and that's just what the Bain Act would have done. It would have held uh, law enforcement uh, liable personally for the wanting take, taking of a life of, of any type of abuse that led to the loss of life or um, but that was one of the major pushbacks but again i also believe if, unless you have some skin in the game it's not going to change your behavior all right we're going to go to london calling us from culver city good morning hi good morning dominique I'm almost on the same vein as the last caller. The, the police officers need to be personally held accountable for their actions. And the one thing that I've never heard anybody talk about is having police officers take out malpractice insurance or general liability. I've been a professional, and I've had to take out a million dollars worth of general liability for any mistakes that I might make. If my doctor makes a mistake, he has malpractice insurance. And what that does is, okay, maybe you make one mistake. Your general liability will pay for that mistake. But that insurance company is going to raise your premiums the next time you do that. And that will weed out these bad officers, whether they are uh, purposely trying to do evil things or if they're doing things on accident, it will get rid of these officers on the financial end because insurance companies aren't going to keep paying that out. Got it, London. Uh, I, that is actually something people have called and talked about on the weekday front page, which is 4.30 to 6 a.m. weekdays, by the way. Senator Bradford, what do you think about that? Without a doubt, that's, what, again, what the Bain Act in this bill uh, would have done. Uh, um, 731 did two things, police certification and held police personally liable for low, uh, unlawful taking of a life. And I, again, unless the, you have the, some skin in the game, I, I don't think it's going to change any of these officers' behavior, but it's much pushback there. Uh, they were more opposed to uh, the Bain Act Amendment in the bill than they were uh, of police decertification. Explain the decertification piece, how that works. And by the way, it, it, it does exist in other places. It exists in 45 other states. And what police decertification is, is a common sense measure of getting rid of bad cops. Not all cops, because we all agree, regardless of what your position is, 95% of the men and women who do the job do it in a respectful and honorable honorable way every day. But decertification would be a, be a method to get rid of those officers who have taken a life, who has forged evidence, who have physically abused someone, who has sexually harassed someone, uh, criminal acts. Criminal acts that are clearly I identified, and they say, well, what about police officers' bill of rights? This does not touch police officers' bill of rights. They would still have their day in the sun. It would create an independent review made up of citizens as well as law enforcement to review those charges once an officer has been brought up for decertification. And they would have a right to appeal as well. But what it would be would be truly fair to the officers, but have real teeth that is going to do something but provides the transparency and involvement that the community wants and it was three that was the three approaches that we were taking something that was truly fair to the officers that it was transparent that involved community input and had real teeth and that's what it would do and 45 other states have a measure i mean georgia and florida have police to certification but california doesn't Senator Steve Bradford, thank you so much for joining us this morning. And good to know we uh, have another shot at this in 2021. Thank you, Dominic. And let's keep the pressure on because we will be reintroducing this measure. Thank you for this opportunity. It is the front page, Saturday Town Hall edition. We're broadcasting live from the 1-800-THE-LAW-2 studio, Radio Free, 102.3 KJLH.